Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining me today on Podcast 10. This is the Solar Coaster series, A Diary of Me with R. Kelly, and um, we're going to be moving into public announcement. So I still thought a group was a good idea because groups were still the big sellers. My new life began with me singing at Chicago's Cotton Club on South Michigan Avenue, a joint once operated by Ralph Bottles Capone, Al Capone's older brother. Here you, you're still interested in forming a group, a guy called Andre Boykin said to me one night after a gig. That's right. Well, me and two friends sing and dance a little. Cool. I want to hear y'all. How about tomorrow? Tell me where and when. We met in a workout room I was using to rehearse. Dre was right. His boys, Earl Robinson and Rick Webster, were okay, so I started training them. Training was rough. I told them from Jump Street, fellas, this ain't going to be no picnic. We're going to go for the gold. We're going to train like it's the Olympics every day in every way. I'm not interested in just becoming good. We've got to be great. We're competing with the best groups in the country, whether they be in New York, Hollywood, or Atlanta. I'll be calling practice not once a day, but three times a day. We'll be hitting it not five days a week, but seven. I'm talking about the steps, harmony, stage presence, the whole bit. And I'm still, and I'm also talking about physical training. We are more than just singers and dancers. We're athletes. Maybe they didn't believe me that night, but when we started running the rocks along Lake Michigan, they believed me then. We were doing push-ups and sit-ups like the Chicago Bulls getting ready for the playoffs. As I was working on putting my new group together, I was approached by a well-known house music DJ named Wayne Williams, who ran a small office and recording studio for Jive Records in Chicago. Wayne's really the guy who discovered me. He had heard me with the MGM at the Backyard Barbecue in North Chicago, even before we signed to the other record deal. He would later tell reporters that he was blown away when he saw us performing. Somehow he picked up on the fact that I was the leader of the group and was impressed with our energy, choreography, and showmanship. I could tell right away this kid had the eye of the tiger, William said. Wayne had kept track of me over the months and followed what I was doing during my MGM days. In the early 80s, Jive Records had some R&B hits with Billy Ocean by 91. Jive was mostly known as one of the biggest labels for rock music with Boogie Down Productions, DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince and Kumo D. Because of the deal I'd been part of with the M with MGM, I still had some obligations to another record company. But when Jive signed me, they bought me out of that previous contract. I named the new group R. Kelly in public announcement. The concept was my vision. With me writing all the songs, singing all the leads, and doing all the producing. Ten months after signing with Jive, our album, Born Into the 90s, debuted in 92. There, were, there I was, 24 years old, on the cover of Out Front with my fresh fade, suited in leather, surrounded by my boys' public announcement. My dream had finally become reality. We had an honest-to-goodness album. The sound was very much both of and ahead of its time. Of course, New Jack Swing was represented, but so were my R&B roots. With the release of the first single, the New Jack Swing hit, She's Got That Vibe, folks kept comparing my voice to Aaron Hall from Guy. It wasn't a coincidence that I sounded like Aaron. Guy was hitting big, and I wanted some of those hits. After all, Aaron sounded like Charlie Wilson of the Gap Band, and I liked Charlie. I liked Aaron. I could do what they did. If I could absorb Donnie Hathaway and Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder when I was a kid, as a young man, I could sure as hell be a sponge that could soak up what was hot on the radio now. Also on that first album in the ballet dedicated, which I had written years earlier for my mother, if you listen to my voice now and listen to it on either song from back then, you'll see it's really got the same tone. Jive was a company with an international view and the owner, Clive Calder, said he not only wanted to break us out in America, he wanted to promote us all over Europe and the rest of the world, too. So before I knew it, I was headed for Europe. I could hardly wait to get to England, but I had a deep fear of flying. I still do. Up until now, I had flown a few times in the United States, but the more I flew, the deeper my fear grew. I'm a person that likes to do things that make sense and i didn't make and it didn't make sense to me how heavy how a heavy plane could stay up in the air like that it just didn't feel right 
I was less fearful though when my mother was sitting next to me. So I made sure that my mom came along on the tour. Her presence always had a calming effect on me. The problem was my mother was crazy about flying, wasn't crazy about flying either. So it ended up that the first time I took a real drink was on a flight to England. Mom and I both took a shot of Hennessy and conked out. I'd never been out of the country before. I imagine huge crowds and pretty girls chasing us back to our hotel, but my imagination was racing ahead of reality. To say that our first show didn't attract a huge crowd would be an understatement. There were only about five people in the audience. My group members were crushed. To this day, I've never allowed numbers to affect my performance. At intermission, I told the group, I don't care if there's only one person out there. We got to sing like there, there are thousands. Then they started playing our first song. She's got that vibe on the radio. And at the next show, maybe 20 people showed up. My guys were still down. Get up. I said, it's going to get better. I guarantee it. By the end of our run, Vibe was all over London, becoming a top three in England. And now the venues were packed. By the time we got to Holland, She's Got That Vibe was one of the top 10 best-selling records in the country. Fans were screaming our names in the streets and women were wanting, were waiting for us in a lobby. As much as I wanted attention, I'd never encountered anything like it before. Sudden fame and the blitz of fame affected, tripped me out and made me a little bit anxious at first. Your dream's coming true, Rob, my mother said on the plane home, just like I knew it would. Back in the U.S., Vibe was all over the radio and the video was playing on all the video shows in heavy rotation. I was eager to see the reaction of the people back home. I wanted to see if I'd be recognized. First, I went to a predominantly white mall. No one recognized me. Then I went to Evergreen Mall in the suburb of Chicago. Back then, we called it Ever Black because all the time it was the black mall. It was the first indoor shopping mall in America at Evergreen. I went to a clothing store for high, for high school girls. I figured someone would recognize me there. I stared a, a girl right in the face and even stared, started singing my song. I wanted her to say, oh, are you one of the, the one who sings? She's got that vibe, but she didn't say a thing. Our second single, Honey Love, had a video behind it that we shot in LA. I've always loved movies and I've always been very involved in the storyline and direction of all my my music videos. For the She's Got That Vibe video, I created all the choreography and on the way to the shoot in New York, I wanted to give us some different, um, something different that no other group had, something to give us an edge. So we stopped at a store on the way to the shoot and I picked up a bunch of flashlights that we rigged onto our hats. Everybody who saw the Vibe video asked where we got them. We continued to use that look at shows and we used them again in the Honey Love video. Light and the use of light or lack of it has always played a big role in my life. There were rumors that Miss Holly Berry plays my love interest in the Honey Love video. But let me put that rumor to rest. That's not Miss Berry. It's a video actress who looks like something like her. When the Honey Love video st started getting played in Chicago, I went back to Evergreen Mall. This time I went with my crew. When we got to the store, I had one of my posse yell out, hey, that's R. Kelly over there. The girls came running. Man, it was a great feeling, my guy said. He's only singing albums, no singles. The store sold a ton of albums that day. When we went on tour, we did the same routine in the record stores all over the country. Meanwhile, when I went to white malls, I still got love, still got no love. Eventually, I would, but it took time. My time with public announcement was good. Born into the 90s, sold a million copies, and it had reached number three slot on the top R&B album chart and was certified platinum. You're my girl. <clears throat> I said those words to Lanise time and time again. I said them because they were true. Niece inspired all of my early songs. I made enough money for me and Niece to rent an apartment together in a nice building on 75th and Lakeshore Drive. I felt like we were the Jeffersons on TV, living in the high rise up in the sky. I was rolling. When we wanted a special night, we got a room at the High Park Inn. Staying there was like being out of town, plus hotel rooms can heat up the loving. The loving between me and Niece was scorching high. 
then why did I do what I did? One night I found myself in that same room, the special room that me and niece love to share with another woman. My plan was just to hit it and quit it. Just a couple of hours of pleasure. I didn't want to pass up. Somehow though, niece learned I was there and called the room. What are you doing in our room without me, Rob? She was crying. I had to think quick. I'm here to meet with Tony, Tony, Tony. They're coming over here. Who is Tony, Tony, Tony? You don't know who Tony, Tony, Tony is? Now I was getting mad that she didn't know who my alibi was. I don't care who they are. What does that have to do with you being in the room without me? I rented the room because Tony, Tony, Tony are coming up here to audition me. They're looking for a new singer. Well, I want to meet Tony, Tony, Tony said niece. They're already come and gone. I'm on my way up there. You're more than welcome, baby. I'm on my way. Like lightning, I got the chick out of the room. I ran around like a crazy man, found the maid to change the sheets and the towels. I had to make it seem like I was the only one who'd been there. By the time niece arrived, I was cool. I thought I fooled her, but I hadn't. She knew. As my mother used to say, busted, disgusted, and couldn't be trusted. Women always know when their men are cheating. And they say, for every action, there's a reaction. Niece reacted by doing what I did. She found someone else. At first, I didn't want to believe it, but then came proof. One night, she and her best friend were supposed to meet me and her friend's boyfriend. They didn't show up. Something was wrong. I went to niece's mama's house, but he but her folks didn't know where she was at. Lanice and her girlfriend said they'd be coming back here, she said her said her grandmother. The other guy and I turned into detectives. I found the hiding place to park our car. We sat there and waited. Finally at four AM a big white Mercedes pulled up. A guy was driving and niece was sitting next to him. Her girl and another dude were in the back seat. When the ladies got out of the out and the guys pulled away, I popped out. What are you doing here, niece asked me, wondering what you're doing out till four in the morning. Having fun, I figured. Fun with who? Rob, I'm not going to stand here and get cross-examined by you, um, of all people. You have no right. At this moment, I knew niece was right. I thought at the times I fooled around behind her back. I had nothing more to say. We tried to work it out, but I knew she was fed up. Her mind and heart had checked out of our love. A week later, something happened that upset her, and I couldn't figure out what it was. Then I found out that the guy Lanice had been creeping with wasn't treating her right, and that upset me. A couple nights later, I got an unexpected call. Look, I got no beef with you, man, but I got to tell you that your girl's confused. She don't know who she wants, you or me. I ain't... It ain't me who's chasing her. It's her who's chasing me. I confronted niece. Who do you want? I asked him. I died inside as though I'd been shot through the heart. I felt worse than any moment in my life. He's no good for you, I told her. He's going to hurt you. And you haven't, robbed? Not like him. Hurt is hurt. I want to make it work for us. It's too late, she said. I'm gone. My life with niece was over. Don't give me no kid off the street. Give me the president. I've always had a big inventory of songs, even starting out. I have more songs than I knew what to do with. That's because songs float in my mind the way clouds float in the sky. My work ethics were intense and insane. I thought nothing of staying up three or four nights in a row writing or recording records. At the time, I didn't know the downside of working so hard, didn't want to know it, and honestly didn't care. My music was a 24-7 compulsion. For me, it was a natural thing. Before I was even sure what producing meant, I was producing myself. I was figuring out the grooves. I was coming up with the parts for the keyboard, the bass, drummer, and guitarist. I was arranging my own background vocals, and most of the time I was singing all the parts. When I auditioned for Barry Hankerson, he asked me if I had written the songs that I had sung. When I told him that I had, he asked me if I could produce two. I said, yeah, because I had wanted him to take me on. But at the time, I didn't really know what producing was. I went home and asked my mother, the way you put your music together when you're writing your songs, that means you're a producer, my mother said. It does? Absolutely. Very few artists can produce themselves. We're talking about Ray Charles, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Prince, musicians of that caliber. When you have producing talent, though, you need to work it on other artists as well as yourself. 
I agreed. I realized that I wouldn't be truly great until I made another artist great. I needed to find that artist. I asked my manager to find an artist for me to produce. One day, my manager picked me up and took me um, and told me I'd be producing David Paston. I was excited to meet David, a former school teacher who had become one of the newest hot R&B singers in the country. At that time, I would have been excited to meet any celebrity, but I seen David on Showtime at the Apollo in the late 80s. His version of Billie Holiday's God Bless the Child tore up the crowd. He was an amazing singer and his fans were calling him New Luther. The meeting with David happened before Born Into the 90s hit the airwaves, so David wasn't really aware of my writing or singing skills. Rob said, my manager, he's going to love your songs. You're the perfect producer to produce this guy to the next level. We drove to the hotel where David was staying. I was in the front seat and my manager was driving. When David came out, he didn't get into the car. He came to the front and just looked in until it became clear that I needed to hop out and sit in the back seat so that he could sit up in front. David was cordial but cold. Riding over to the studio, there was hardly any talk. The vibe was nervous. In the studio, I got to work. I played David a bunch of songs I'd written. I just knew that a couple of them were smash hits. He listened without saying a word. Then David mentioned my manager to follow me, him into the recording booth. They didn't realize the mic was on, so I, I heard the whole conversation. I thought I told you to get Teddy Riley. Teddy can't do nothing but make hits. He's the king of New Jack Swing. Teddy's the president. Teddy's not available. Then make him available. Don't give me some kid off the street. Give me the president. Give me the kid. Give the kid a chance. You won't be sorry. David finally caved, but his heart wasn't in it. He made up his mind that I was no hit maker. I tried. I said, David, you got an unbelievable voice. Now just don't over riff on the verse. Sing it like this. And I show him how to, how it went. When it came time to record, though, Peaston changed it back to his over-rifting style and ruined the whole feel. We went back and forth like that for two hours until I finally saw what I had to do. I got up and left. Where are you going? The singer and my manager both asked me at the same time. I'm going to McDonald's for a double cheeseburger and fries. When are you coming back? I'm not. And I didn't. I had another early encounter with a celebrity who was a hell of a lot more pleasant. In fact, it was a highlight of my life because it involved my mother. My manager always worked with this singer who was an artist that loved my music. She was a down to earth lady who reminded me of my mother and I knew my mother would love to meet her. Can I bring my mother over today? I asked the singer. My hair is all up in curlers. My face is covered with cold cream and I'm wearing an old house coat. My mom won't care, I said. If she don't care, Rob, I don't care. An hour or so later, my mother and I arrived. I didn't tell mom the lady's name. I just introduced her as a friend in the music business. Mind if I smoke? My friend asked my mother. Take one of my Winstons, mom said. They lit up, drank coffee together, and started discussing everything under the sun. Their children, men in their lives, TV shows they like, movie stars they thought were the cutest. You would have thought they'd grown up together. After an hour of this, I couldn't take it anymore. I turned to my mother and said, Mom, do you know who this lady is? She's your friend. Now, she's my friend too. I repeated, do you know who this lady is? Look closely in her face. Look closely in her eyes. I'm looking, Rob. I'm looking. Several seconds passed. And then my mother screamed, oh, my Lord, it isn't. You can't be. My friend started laughing. I'm afraid it is, Says she said. You cannot be. I am. Gladys Knight. Asked my mother, still in shock. That's what my parents named me, said Gladys, hugging her like she was her best friend in all the world. Twelve play. On the poster, my name was barely big enough to read. It was the early 90s. I was in my mid-20s and I was on the road with two big stars. I was the opening act. The late Gerald Levert, of course, was royalty. His daddy, Eddie Levert, was one of the mighty OJs. Gerald had been lead singer for Levert, who had big hits with Pop, 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 Goes My Mind and Casanova. He just released his first solo album and the title song, Private Line, was already a number one hit. Glenn Jones, who got second billing, had a hit record with We've Only Just Begun, a song the ladies loved. He'd also been on the charts with Show Me and Bring Back Your Love, like Gerald Glenn could sing. 
I wasn't thrilled about being third on the bill because when I started singing, folks were just walking in. Most of the seats were still empty. I was feeling frustrated because I had worked hard putting my show together with what I had. I didn't really have lights at all because I was the opener. I had what looked like a flashlight on me and I had a smoke machine to enhance my presentation. Lighting has always been extremely important to me. I want to be heard, but I also want to be seen in the right light. Lighting shapes mood and for the mood, the moods got to be right. Meanwhile, as the tour went on, Honey Love, my new single, started to really blow up. It got to the point where the promoters saw that I was starting to generate more heat than Glenn Jones. They decided to have him open. That meant I'd come on just before Gerald. Glenn snapped about the rearrangement and I could understand why. I didn't want to disrespect him, but I also wanted to reach more people. I was tired of singing to an empty house. The first night went really well. People were in their seats and got to see me. I was feeling good about the new lineup. The second night, though, they wouldn't let me use my little light or my smoke machine. I figured if I was moving up in the show, I should get more, not less. The promoters didn't see it that way. They wanted to keep the spotlight on the bona fide star. I respected Gerald as an artist and a man, so I went to his dressing room to discuss it. I feel you, young fella, Gerald said, but in this business, you got to pay your dues. My daddy did, I did, and now you're paying him too. It's part of the deal. I thanked Gerald for breaking it down to me and left. He was right, but that also didn't stop me from thinking, what can I do that would still ignite this crowd where I could still stand out and do me, even if I'm singing in, a pit, singing in pitch black? I needed a gimmick, a take my show to the next level, something that would make people remember me. That's how I created 12 Play. I thought about it for a couple days and I finally came up with a little skit, me just talking to the audience. At the point in the show where I would break down Honey Love, I would start talking to the audience. Can I tell you all something? Can I keep it real? Can I tell you about a dream I had last night? Well, I actually had a dream where I made love to Mary J. Blige. Everyone reacted with the big, woo, Mary J's first multi-platinum album, What's the 411, was super hot. And here I was talking about kicking it with her. The audience got a big kick out of picturing me with Mary. I went on, hey, it was only a dream, but it was so vivid it felt real. But in this dream, it was more than four play. It was 12 play. Y'all want to hear it? Can I sing it to y'all? And how it went, everyone yelled, yes. About now, my piano player started backing me up with sexy runs on the keyboard while I sang, one, we'll go to the room of fun. Um, I sang, I'll say, give me your tongue. The audience roared three, because tonight I'm going to, I'm going to grab my crouch and sing. I grabbed my crouch and sang fully your fantasy. And the women went crazy. It was a rap. I had never heard the crowd scream that loud during the whole tour, during everybody's show. And that was just on three. At that moment, I had an instant double dose of confidence in me. I was on that stage. I knew that I could excite a crowd with more than just having a singing hit record. I knew I now knew that I could tell a story or give a testimony or play a game with the audience. That was something that would set me apart from everybody else. By the time the show got to the next city, fans had already heard about this 12 play and started screaming the moment I mentioned Mary J. Word spread like wildfire. And this was way before Twitter and Facebook even existed. Girl, a female from Detroit would tell her friend in Cleveland, you got to go get uh, see this show and hear R. Kelly sing about this 12 play. It's the bomb. When I went to the radio stations to promote Born Into the 90s, the DJs just wanted to hear about 12 play. It was the talk of every town I went to before I arrived. Haven't recorded it yet, I say, but I will. Matter of fact, it's going to be the title of my second album. The song was causing such a sensation that Gerald Levert's people told me told my manager that they didn't want me to perform it anymore. The reason they gave, because it hadn't been recorded yet, was lame, where it was written that an artist can only perform a song he's recorded. I just continued to do my show. My management backed me up. Long as the ladies keep yelling for it, they said, you keep singing it. By the end of the tour, no one could deny that the highlight of every show was when I got out there and started discussing a dream I had about loving on Mary J. Blige. <laughs> 
The makings of me. Chicago is the center of my universe. My home as a baby, a boy, a teenager, a young man, and an adult. To me, Chicago is the soul of America. It's the home of my soul. It has its own unique musical vibe. Born into the 90s had been a great buzz album and a great way to introduce R. Kelly to the public. The guys in public announcement had been my background singers and dancers, but the plan had always been that on my second album, I would do a solo artist, not the leader of a group. The guys would still be in the video and tour with me, but the second album was all about launching R. Kelly. I wanted the next album to be something that was going to stick around for a long time. I wanted people to know that I was in it for the long ride. In order to do that, I had to take the music, melody, and lyrics to the next level. So I went into the studio totally focused on achieving my goal. I wanted people to know that this was real, that I was real. 12 Play started out from a skit that I come up, up with to help me get through a tour, but that concept blew up and took on a life of its own. By the time I got home from the tour, the song 12 Play was already a smash. So there was a big demand for the record. The song was so successful that I decided I would do a whole album called 12 Play. I would spend my sound checks writing new songs for the album so that I could record them as soon as I got home. Chicago is the center of my universe. My home is a baby, a boy, a teenager, a young man, an adult. To me, Chicago is the soul of America. It is the home of my soul. It has its own unique musical vibe. Chicago has launched the careers of many extraordinary artists from Sam Cooke to Kanye West. It's the home to many different kinds of amazing music. And I'm determined to make sure it's properly recognized and respected. I wrote the entire album over a month and a half. But when I started working on it, I had some concerns. I knew the song 12 Play was strong in concert and the ladies were loving it, but the popularity of New Jack Swing had helped me get, helped get me out there. I felt I needed to develop musically if I wanted to have the longevity of a Marvin Gaye or a Stevie Wonder. The song 12 Play had introduced me to my true self musically and there was no going back. On the one hand, my management and the label were saying that because she's got that vibe and especially Honey Love did so well, I should be careful not to move too far away from that sound. They wanted to sell records and the New Jack Swing thing was still the hottest seller out there. I thought about what they said. This was to be my first album as a solo singer, no group, no one on the cover but me. I didn't want to make any foolish mistakes. I wanted to bust out with the winner. On the other hand, I knew in my heart that it was time to take off the training wheels it was time to introduce R. Kelly, the real R. Kelly, to the world. I felt like a, a fireman who'd gone through all the training and practice drills. When he finally hears the bell go off, he's ready to slide down the pole, jump on that big red fire truck, and go put out a fire. More than just having the gift of music, I think, I have the gift of having the mind of musical science. I'm not afraid to research or try different things, stretching genres and boundaries. I wanted to bring new music. Um, I wanted to be not like anyone else. That desire was as strong for me as being in the music business. I didn't want to be just some singer or some writer. I wanted to be great. I wanted to be remembered for my work, having the desire, the passion, and being blessed with the gift and being able to channel where I come from and what I've been through. Having a gift is not enough. It needs to be cultivated and shared. When I went to the record, when I went to record the new album, I was able to be both more patient and more innovative in the process. I started recording the songs I'd written um, while I was on the road or downtown at CRC Studios, but my mom's house was the hangout spot. Much as I tried, I couldn't get her to move out of the hood and into a, new, a newer place. She had her friends and her life there, and that's where she wanted to stay. 12 Play was inspired by conversations with my mom, aunties and their friends hanging out on the porch. They would be listening to their favorites. Um, one night I was chilling out on the porch with them and we were listening to Teddy Pendergrass. 
That's baby making music right there. That's right. Y'all was born off Teddy Pendergrass. Y'all born off Marvin Gaye. What do you know about this? One of my aunties challenged me. And that's when the direction for the 12 play album became even clearer. I had to make a baby making album. If Marvin Gaye did it, I wanted to do it. I wanted to make an album that people would want to make love to and not just make babies, but want to get married, want to love someone, want to make love to somebody and to expand the population. I thought I had a head start with the song 12 play. I was also inspired by the stories that my mom told me about going to the Regal Theater and being able to see everybody from Marvin Gaye to Stevie Wonder. I wanted that kind of legacy for myself. I wanted people to be sitting on their porches and talking about 12 play albums someday, like my mom and her friends talking about their favorite artists and their songs. But I wanted to be alive and still in the game, still making hits when that day came. As far back as my first high school performance in my days singing at the subway, my gut took me to a new hook, something that made people remember my act. When I was creating 12 Play, I wanted to create a buzz and attract attention. Sex and sensuality were going to be my hook. I saw the album as a suit in 12 parts. It was my play to win the attention and love of music fans all over the world. Sex Me was deliberately designed to generate a little controversy. A group called H-Town had had a big hit called Knockin' the Boots. Sex Me was going to take what they started to a whole new level. And because I had been in Europe and toured America playing in summer jams and major arenas, I knew how to excite a crowd. Now the challenge was to put that excitement, that sensuous but also spiritual excitement into a record that reflected my true heart one that would reveal the makings of me bump and grind the second single from the 12 play album definitely fits in the baby making music category the song was originally written for the movie minister society um, at the request of the directors the hughes brothers the song was supposed to play over the scene of jada pinkett smith and lorenz tate in bed together I was excited to do it because it was the first time I'd been asked to do a song for a movie before. When they heard Bump and Grind, the Hughes brothers loved the song, but the record company and my manager decided that the song should be released on my album and not the soundtrack. There were a lot of politics about that at the time, and they ended up using Honey Love in the movie instead. But keeping the song for the 12 Play album was probably the best thing for me because that song gave me my first number one record on the Billboard pop charts and was the longest running number one record on the R&B chart at that time. Still, I knew my second album had to better had to be better than the first. The lyrics had to be more direct, more authentic, more reflective of my experiences, emotions, and of course my city. I also knew it would be dedicated to my mother. What I didn't know though was by the time the album came out, my world would be changed forever. While I was making the 12 play album, I spent many nights in the studio. A lot of that emotion showed up on the tracks. When you hear an unexpected position, bring it on, any secret fantasy baby, I will fulfill as long as you sex me and sex me parts one and two, you're hearing raw, unfiltered, youthful desires coming through in those lyrics. I had a song that said, it's time, it seems like you're ready. And I knew the ladies were ready and I was ready. I wanted an album that would make love to every woman in the world. I wanted it to talk honestly to them and touch them in satisfying sensual ways. The spirit of seduction was heavy on me and I saw no reason not to go for it. The album was an extended version of the concert with all the pleading, teasing, mood setting, foreplay and getting nasty with sex me. The gritty climatic song, I didn't do nothing. Oh, I don't see nothing wrong with a little bump and grind. I felt your body calling me. I like the crotch on you. And I wasn't afraid to ask the ladies to sex me. While I was making the album, my mother got sick. I found out later that she'd gone to the hospital for some tests, but she downplayed them to me as well as my brothers and my sister telling me, baby, you're busy making your music. You go on and keep working. Don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine. I'm just tired. That's all. But what do the doctors say? I asked the doctors say the same thing, baby, that they say that I'm going to be just fine. You go do what you got to do. I'm supposed to head back to Europe for some concerts, then go to Europe, Rob. You know I hate flying. I said, flying is always a lot easier if you're sitting next to me. 
I'll be with you next time. I want you with me this time. I said, I don't want to go on that plane without you. You'll do fine without me, son. Call me every night if you want to. I will. I did. When I went to Europe this time, the crowds were four times bigger than before. That made me happy, but it wasn't the same without my mother with me. I got another couple of weeks out here on the road, mom. I told her on the phone, I really want you here with me. If you want me to come out there, son, I will. But I thought you said you got to go back to the hospital for more tests. I do, but the test can wait. If I have to, I can get on a plane tomorrow. No, mom, I want you to have those tests. Take care of yourself. That's more important. God will take care of you, son. I know he will. In those last weeks, the European fans kept coming. The tour was a success. I couldn't wait to get home and share that success with my mother. Okay, we're going to stop here. And tomorrow, we're going to move on to she's teaching angels how to love. Okay, and uh, thank you so much for listening to this podcast and commenting on what your feelings are um, about the process, the process of R. Kelly going through, you know, his own moving into his own and um, that that seems to have been the best thing for him because a lot of people were taking advantage of the things that he was doing with the groups and everything. So yeah, so thank you so much and you have a great day.